Hello and welcome to Dialogue. U.S. Special Envoy for Climate John Kerry wraps up his four-day visit to China. Kerry met with senior Chinese officials to discuss how the U.S. and China could improve cooperation to address climate change. How much progress has been made during these long hours of discussion? Can the two sides manage to cooperate amidst this current Chile-China-U.S. relations? And what can the world's two largest economies contribute to tackling this challenge to mankind? To discuss these issues and more, I'm glad to be joined by Ma Jun, Director with the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs. Zhou Rui, Chairman of the Bridge Tank, a member of the Task Force on Climate Change and Finance in the G20, and Brandon Andrews, former Hill staffer and entrepreneur. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ma Jun. Uh, we know that John Kerry, you know, during his stay in Beijing, he talked with uh, a number of Chinese leaders, so, you know, Premier Li Qiang, uh, senior diplomat Wang Yi, and of course the Chinese uh, envoy for climate change, Xie Jinghua. Uh, you know, reports say they had uh, like nine hours of discussion between the two special envoys on climate change. Uh, so Ma Jun, what do we know about the major topics or the major concerns from both sides? Yeah, I think it, this, this um, uh, talks uh, between the two special envoys uh, uh, can last so long, you know, considering that, uh, that their age put together uh, is over 154 years. And um, uh, just think about that, uh, the two old uh, special envoys really uh, delve very deep. Uh, I can only um, uh, expect uh, that they delve very deep into the uh, rather complex but uh, but much needed uh, discussions uh, between the two countries' uh, climate actions. Uh, these two are the largest economies in the world, and also in the meantime, the largest uh, greenhouse gas emitters. Uh, uh, there. Our emission put together, China and U.S., um, is nearly half of the global total. So, the, the, so, so with, uh, with the climate change um, challenge uh, is getting so urgent, so pressing, uh, with all this heat wave uh, uh, happened in such a much higher frequency and intensity, uh, it is absolutely important for the two countries, uh, uh, to, uh, for these two countries to to, to talk to each other. Uh, but, um, but I'm also very happy to see uh, that, uh, that Kerry has the, has the chance to meet with uh, Premier Li Chang and uh, our top, top diplomat, uh, Wang Yi, because um, the atmosphere of our climate, climate co collaboration uh, is, is hinges, upon, hinges upon the, the big climate uh, of uh, China-U.S. relations, uh, so the discussion with uh, with senior officials, uh, uh, I think, I hope, paved the way for further collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joe, obviously, you know, this uh, discussion between the two special envoys on climate change, you know, resumed uh, uh, after it was disrupted uh, last year because of Nancy Pelosi's uh, visit to Taiwan. Uh, tell us you know, how significant it is you know, for the resumption, I guess, you know, both for climate change and also for the bilateral relations, probably even for the rest of the world. First of all, that's very relevant because it's, it's a real high level. Uh, John Kerry is a special envoy. He's not any random special envoy. Remember his punchline in conferences, he keeps introducing himself as, I used to be the next president of the USA, you know, then he keeps hiding, he doesn't find it funny, but he, he conveys a political weight and he conveys absolute trust from President Biden. So this is extremely important. Uh, the level of political personnel he's met in China is the same from Premier, uh, from Premier to uh, Senior Diplomat Wang Yi. Uh, so I think uh, here we are facing discussions at the topmost level uh, near that's one. Two, I think there are two stringent issues. One is the emissions. Uh, Marjun has mentioned that 
very importantly, and there's an acceleration in, in the uh, climate disorder, so the issue of emissions is absolutely important. The second one, according to me, is, is climate finance. Climate finance has to be accelerated. This will be the best way to limit the emissions. And China, both China and America, have an edge in climate finance. And this will be very important to see that those two poles of climate finance in the world cooperate rather than compete. So I think this must have been, I suspect this must have been a key important issue in the nine hours discussion. Mm. Uh, we'll come back and touch upon that topic uh, furthermore. Uh, but before that, uh, you know, uh, Brandon, you know, we know these talks took place at a time when we are witnessing this extreme, you know, hot weather basically in West America, in China, and the European continent, you know, something unusual. Uh, new records are being set on a daily basis. Uh, so do you think we are having an extra urgency probably to deal with climate change, you know, bringing China to US together, the two largest uh, economies and also two largest emitters here? Well, first, I think these talks are very positive. Uh, the Secretary of the Treasury during her visit recently said that the U.S. and China just aren't talking enough, that the citizens in the U.S. and China um, have too much distance between them, and that on the official level, Chinese and U.S. officials just haven't been in the same room together to talk and really build the relationship. So this is a step forward in that regard. When it comes to the global temperature, at sometimes it takes an issue impacting you personally uh, for our officials, um, for our leaders to actually make decisions um, that will cause some kind of positive change. And so hopefully the rise in global te te temperature will raise the temperature in the room when it comes to putting pressure on U.S. and Chinese officials to move some of these pieces forward. Glasgow um, was a step in the right direction. There were a number of affirmations made. Of course, you mentioned that the Taiwan visit by Nancy Pelosi, politics kind of coming in and interrupting the progress on climate. But now we have an opportunity to reset and move forward. And it's not just the heat outside. Um, as you know, when the global temperature rises, um, the temperature of the water rises, which can cause more hurricanes in the United States. And there's currently a typhoon off the coast of, of China. And so these differences are being felt uh, and not only by um, leaders as they walk outside, but by citizens who are going to be affected by some of these significant um, changes in weather. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Marjane, you know, uh, during the talks, you know, Kerry stressed that the need, a quote, uh, for China to decarbonize the power sector, uh, cut methane uh, emissions and uh, reduce deforestation. Uh, obviously, this is a concern from the Chinese side. Uh, from the U.S. side, I'm sure there are concerns from the Chinese side. Uh, tell us uh, firstly, you know, w w what's, uh, China has been doing basically uh, to improve probably the efforts you know, against the climate change here? Yeah, with that, we need to put things into perspective. China is, uh, um, is going through a massive industrialization and urbanization. So unlike the Western countries have uh, naturally, most of them have naturally uh, peaked uh, their emission. And now the uh, challenge is, uh, uh, is to try to bend the curve faster in their emission reduction. China hasn't um, f uh, complete uh, finish its uh, uh, industrialization and urbanization. So as a result, um, the, um, there is a rising consumption of, uh, of energy and um, uh, because China have uh, uh, only relatively richer resources in coal, so as a result, uh, you know, for a period of time, China's coal consumption really uh, grew dramatically. From 2000 to 2011, China's coal consumption got tripled. And um, by 2013, China burned half of the world's total of, uh, of, of coal. So. This is not only the source of the global climate change, but also uh, it's, uh, it's a major source of the smog. So to deal with uh, at that time, you know, China had decided first, you know, to tackle the air quality problem. So through a 10 year um, 
uh, efforts, you know, with uh, with the Clean Air Action Plan, China managed to stabilize its uh, its coal consumption ever since 2013, um, and um, for a for for five years of time, it's actually started uh, declining uh, after China shut down uh, thousands upon thousands of coal mines to do with air pollution. So uh, through all these efforts, uh, uh, it's uh, it's a major contribution to the. Uh, to the fighting against climate change. Having said that, uh, at this moment, you know China's uh, 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 carbon emission, coal consumption, is still rather high, and um, uh, particularly when the uh, COVID hit, and then the turbulent global energy market, uh, and and with the geopolitical tension uh, rising, uh, highlighted by the, the by, by the war in Europe. Um, so all this have shifted, you know, have uh, have made uh, energy security a top priority, not just in China, but but to many global, uh, major global economies. Uh, so as a result, uh, uh, to ensure energy security, China and uh, some of the other, uh, many others uh, have to uh, go back to fossil fuel uh, in recent years. You know, the last two years, we have seen a rebound of the global emission, uh, partially because of that. So so now that's the, the challenge. But in the meantime, you know, China have created the so-called one plus N policy framework and um, and very, very solidly push uh, to the uh, to the cleaning up of our, our energy, uh, you know, to push for the energy transition. As a result, you know, China's uh, a renewable energy target set for 2030 will be achieved uh, by 2025, five years ahead of that. And um, and, uh, and China's uh, new energy vehicle, the e-vehicle target uh, set for 2025 have been surpassed last year. Um, so so China has, uh, has been working very, very solidly on the energy uh, transition. So there, that brings a lot of hope, uh, not just to China, but to the entire world. Mm -hmm. uh, back to branding, you know, tell us, you know, what are the U.S., what, uh, you know, are the, probably the current administration, uh, you know, the, and, and, and the, the companies probably, uh, you know, are doing to uh, basically fight climate change and reduce uh, this carbon emission? Uh, obviously, maybe U.S. is uh, another major, major power here in the fight against the change. Definitely. Well, there's bipartisan agreement uh, in the U.S. Congress that we have to make a difference when it comes to uh, climate change. Uh, uh, Special Envoy Kerry uh, testified to Congress right before he left for China, and he actually said um, government isn't going to solve this. It's really up to the private sector. And we've seen over uh, the past several years a number of significant private sector efforts to reduce carbon emissions, to reuse materials, to recycle. I interviewed uh, an, an entrepreneur, Nancy Twine, um, last year at the Clinton Global Initiative. She has a global clean beauty brand called Briogeo, um, which uses um, reusable, sustainable pack packaging um, for all of their products. But we had a conversation about the economics of it and PCR resin, which is a, a, which is a critical reusable material, and the economics making it difficult to scale some of these solutions. And so whether it's Briogeo in the United States or a company like InPower uh, in China that's working on solid state battery technology that may have problems scaling that technology, or a company like um, Arena Recycling, um, which makes eco bricks uh, in Tanzania um, to clean up beach waste and, and also provide sustainable housing for folks. I think there's an opportunity to scale some of these innovative technologies, some of these innovative approaches that have um, proven themselves in the market, but are running into some issues with actually scaling and seeing the significant impact. And so I think in the U.S., but also potentially in China, that's an area where you'll see more focus. And I think whether it's at the G20 in India 
or COP28 in Dubai or some kind of separate convening, I would love to see the U.S. and China connect on some of these innovative solutions, not the, the ones that are nascent technologies, but the ones that have been somewhat proven in the market and are ready to scale up to get them to have the significant impact. But I think that's definitely a focus in the U.S. Um, in addition to, again, um, Glasgow, Paris, uh, and some of the commitments that we've heard President Biden make over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joe, you know, uh, it seems like there are different approaches, you know, for the Chinese side of the government uh, and policies. They do play a very important role in reducing uh, emissions and fight climate change. But in the U.S., you know, probably there's a more, uh, we see, rely more on the market, uh, you know, uh, different players over there. Uh, at the same time, you know, it's also about, a, you know, when it comes to policy, uh, it's not simply about the climate change, it's about industrial policies sometimes. So for example, EVs, you know, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, of course, for the Chinese side, there's concern, U.S. tariffs on some of the Chinese solar panels, etc. What are the differences between the two sides, you know, like how, how likely they are going to overcome the differences in the richer deal, say, before uh, the, the COP28? The, in, in, the, in Dubai? No, thank you for your, for your question. Industry is absolutely important. Energies are industries because energies are technologies. Either technologies you develop and then you need industrial investment and you need to protect uh, industries at infancy or there are technologies you need to scale up and finance but then you develop you need to develop an industry at large. Within this framework, I don't think there are that many differences between China, the US, and for that matter, the EU as well, you know, because everyone has understood now that it's issue of scaling up those renewable energies that work. And the second issue of preparing the energies of the future, like hydrogen, green hydrogen, where we still need research, need an industry, you know, so I think the differences are more in ways than, than in spirit and in strategy. Mm -hmm. Getting back, applying your question to the description that Majun was giving, you know, never forget that renewable energies are those energies, like especially solar and wind, that uh, hook onto electricity. Not all the uses of, electric, of, of energy are electricity. Electricity is only one form, you know. Uh, the other forms are solid liquid and gas. Yeah, solid, this is coal. And on coal, China has managed to curb its use of coal for non-energy purposes. This is why there's this emphasis of uh, minimizing the coal for energy. China has done the first bit, which was to have coal processes towards energy, which are more efficient in terms of technology. But China will be able to gradually exit of coal only if it's able to mobilize the other sources of energy, which is liquid and which is gas. Liquid, China, I think, is quite advanced in the world in limiting the use of uh, liquid mostly to the chemical industry because all in all its uh, uh, mobility industry, the cars, the trucks, and etc., there is this sense of electrification. Oh, now, on the last form of energy, which is gas, here we need a global alliance between China, the US, and most likely Europe to develop and invest into those technologies which are not yet mature in terms of market, namely for the hydrogen and the green hydrogen. And my very last point on that, to give this uh, strategic spectrum on which I really believe there can be an agreement on the industrial basis uh, 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 at the COP28, the other part of the story is the sink, you know, you have the carbon you emit and the carbon you sink in to forest, to restoration of degraded land. Here, China has had a tremendous success in reforestation in number of millions of hectares of land. And we need a global cooperation uh, between countries which master those technology or which have been able to scale it up, like China, into Africa. Because in Africa, you have a lot of land to restore it, which was degraded, which you need to restore, which can serve as carbon sink, not just the forest, but agrarian land. And here is a scope for joint cooperation and for joint finance and green finance between China, the US, and I would say the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joe, you mentioned Africa, you know, uh, earlier you talked about, uh, you know, climate finance. Uh, we know that, you know, according to the Paris Agreement, you know, signed in 2015, 
uh, the rich countries will finance, basically provides the finances for fighting climate change to the developing countries, like I think 100 billion. Uh, where are we now? Well, we are heading towards the 100 million, the 100 million transfer a year, but very slowly. But I think our research points out one major difference between green finance and the rest of finance. The rest of finance, you have your underlying assets, which are either in your country or in the global economy connected to trade. You know, I'm not saying that the underlying factors be, be behind the assets of Wall Street are located in Wall Street in Manhattan, but they're located in the U.S. industry or in the Chinese industry. They're kind of concentrated. The way you want, the day you want to develop green finance, this will be finance on land restoration. This will be great finance on uh, sinks to uh, uh, forests in Africa, in Borneo, in Asia, everywhere, in Latin America, everywhere in the world, which means that the underlying factors of those assets are widespread. So it's much more an issue of political economy and of involving the larger South, the global South, into building this finance. Because if they stop the global North or post China, if they stop the financial markets accessing uh, the land where it happens, then you can't develop those assets. You can't develop the metrics. You can't have the data and you can't secure your assets. So the green finance will have to be collaborative in a much bigger way than the previous finance. So my Long story short is rather than transferring old money to the South, let's create new money, new financial assets on assets which are partly located in the global South, partly operated from the global South and partly operated from the so-called global North. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Marjorie, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, the Chinese uh, efforts. Uh, for example, the investment in the re uh, renewable energy. Uh, China has invested heavily, we know that, in clean energy uh, in recent years. Its solar capacity, for example, is not greater than the rest of the world combined. And the country is also leading the world in wind capacity and electric vehicles, as you also mentioned. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, um, you know, what's the policy or what's the design, the plan ahead? You know, now China is very strong in clean energy, renewable energy, you know, EVs. Uh, what are the challenges, say, probably to reduce, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the emissions, for example? You know, we know it's going to peak in 2030, now 20, five years earlier, 2025, and of course, neutrality in 2060. But of, obviously, the U.S. side is not happy with that. They are, they are basically pressuring China to further reduce uh, carbon emissions. Can China do that? Yeah, China's commitment is try to pick its carbon emission uh, before 2030 and then uh, go carbon neutral before 2060. So that leaves makes room, you know, leaves room for uh, for for this all this target to be achieved earlier. Um, you know, I talked about the uh, you know very complex uh, global challenges and uh, local challenges. Uh, uh, as a result, you know, without a uh, uh, a very um, uh, big, you know, major trust between the different economies, uh, and it, it's uh, some of the route um, trans uh, of uh, transitioning to uh, to to uh, renewable energy uh, is no longer as open. You know, for example, the uh, uh, the shale gas um, and the natural natural gas route. And um, so China have to go directly from coal to the real renewable, solar and wind. And, um, and China's making major investment on that and Chinese companies. And Joe, Joe talked about uh, the private sector. You know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the free market uh, competition uh, in this, uh, in this uh, industry, the solar solar power industry have really created some of the top run uh, global uh, brands you know in china and uh, uh, they're not just uh, very good at uh, manufacturing uh, by making very high quality and low cost uh, uh, solar panels uh, but in the meantime they are now become the uh, innovative power um, uh, globally and um, um, and 
and and um, and can really uh, create to uh, you know provide the, the the basis to create different models. You know, we talked about the financing. I think first and foremost, uh, uh, this one hundred billion uh, uh, compensation to the uh, to to the underdeveloped world need to be honored for sure. But in the meantime, I think it's um you know the all the efforts made in China have created generated new possibilities as well. Uh, you know, particularly on the solar side. You know, the rooftop distributed rooftop photovoltaic uh, have become so popular now in China. You know, through macro arrangement of some microfinancing arrangement, uh, the uh, rural households, the rural residents, they can really take advantage of their rooftop and of their courtyard and um, uh, not just get clean energy, uh, but also make money out of this. So, so this can help China to, uh, to, uh, to achieve poverty relief and also rejuvenate the, uh, the countryside. And I think if this model of microfinancing and uh, rooftop solar panel can be applied in other parts of the world, it can actually help synergize uh, the tackling of climate change with the global efforts to achieve SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. We are also far from achieving that, so lagging behind in our, uh, on our schedule. So I think all this generated new possibilities. Okay, new possibilities. Uh, that's very positive. Uh, uh, now, finally, some politics here. Uh, Brandon, we know that uh, before the talks, uh, John Kerry said that you know climate change uh, negotiation between China and the U.S. Uh, should be uh, stand alone, you know, issue uh, separate from the overall relationship between the two sides. We know, you know, which is not that positive. Uh, at the same time, you know, afterward, Kerry said, you know, did say that, you know, talks uh, about the climate change could provide a fresh start for the two countries and, quote, began to change the broader relationship. What do you make of the remarks? Yeah, I think they're positive. The reality here is the United States and China can always find something to disagree on. I'm completely confident that if you put Chinese and U.S. officials in the room, we're going to both make statements from both sides and find something to disagree on. What Mr. Kerry is saying is, let's find an area of broad agreement, and everyone can agree that these temperatures are having a significant impact on the daily lives of citizens in the United States, in China, and around the world. So I certainly agree with that sentiment. The question is, will both sides be able to come to the table and both make commitments but also potentially make concessions if as we look at glasgow as we look back at paris um, pieces haven't been moved forward and so i i think what we want here again is opportunities for the united states and china to get in the same room and talk and if climate is an area of broad agreement it makes complete sense to me uh to to do that and move forward um even if it's separate uh, from uh, some of the other issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, you, briefly, do you think the climate change talks uh, is separated from the overall relationship? Uh, it's, uh, it's quite hard to separate that. Uh, so that's why I think it's very uh, positive uh, for Kerry to meet, uh, not just with uh, his counterparts, but with uh, more senior uh, officials. Uh, uh, otherwise, all this... Um, uh, expressions of corporations, uh, uh, you know, as we can see before, um, you know, may not be able to carry forward, uh, you know, maybe uh, subject to all these disruptions uh, in the future. Well, thanks to all our guests. With that, we come to the end of today's uh, show. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.